because of course, uh, talking about remedial action uh, objectives in 45 minutes or less uh, is a daunting task. So what I'm gonna try to convey to set up the rest of the day uh, is how uh, remedial action outcomes or uh, re remedial action goals and objectives can guide and inform uh, the remediation uh, screening, uh, testing and selection process. And then the rest of the speakers following suit will, will take you through that process. Um, and because again, 40, 40, 45 minutes is not a long time, I'm gonna go at this from um, a couple of different directions. Uh, use a couple, uh, use a, a EPA uh, framework example and a couple of states, not because they're special, but because um, they're near and dear to me and I understand them perhaps better than some of the other states in Namoa's uh, district. Um, and then some lessons learned around, uh, don't forget to, you know, to uh, keep the end goals in mind. So without biting off more than we can chew, really establishing the, uh, the RAOs is all about what receptor scenarios you have uh, in harm's way potentially, and what the future use is. Those are the two most important things to think about up front. Uh, and then you set those areas by either uh, meeting some risk-based standards or goals that is, uh, in, uh, that is consistent with that future use and uh, those receptor scenarios, and or a combination of protecting or eliminating those receptor pathways via you know, something as simple as capping or uh, isolation of some form or uh, you know, protecting the receptor in some way that the you don't, you're not using risk-based standards, you're actually eliminating the pathway. Simple, yeah. Um, so we'll do some basic risk assessment uh, uh, overview, both from an ecological standpoint and a human health uh, standpoint, uh, just so you understand the nuts and bolts behind how the risk-based standards are derived. Uh, this is not a risk assessment course, uh, but in, and I'm not a risk assessor, but I'm an, I am an end user, as many of you are in the audience, probably all of you. So it's always good to understand what's uh, under the hood. And as I said before, I'll, I'll do that uh, and auger down into uh, what that looks like at both the uh, EPA regional screening level table level and how the uh, risk-based standards and institutional controls are uh, utilized in a couple of example states. Uh, again, um, just because those are, are uh, easy ones for me to do, but uh, obviously there are uh, other frameworks that are similar and uh, slice and paste it slightly differently. So. With that, everybody, uh, everybody gets to start with a conceptual site model. So I picked a simple one, uh, not that simple. Um, so I don't know if I have a laser pointer on. There we go. Hey. So really what we're dealing with is a set of uh, potential contaminant pathways by either surface release or subsurface release or groundwater migration or uh, product uh, uh, migration impacting either uh, ecological um, or human health receptor pathways. So what I'm gonna focus on today, uh, it, no surprise, would be some of those soil standards that are protective of direct contact, but also soil standards that are protective of soil to groundwater leaching pathway, uh, and groundwater standards that are protective of potable use, but also protective of a receiving surface water body and the water body uh, standards themselves. And then a third, uh, just because I really think I can do this in less than 40 minutes, uh, we'll talk about another important uh, human exposure pathway in the form of vapor intrusion and how that's dealt with. But with that, we'll start with the ecological risk assessment basics 101. <laughs> and this is really all about the exposure pathways that could find their way either into an aquatic environment or a terrestrial environment uh, where there are ecological receptors. So traditionally, like um, a two-tiered system if you're deriving ecological-based standards, uh, you're either using something very conservative, um, and these are Massachusetts uh, terminology, but you can transfer that to other states as well. Most uh, will have the ability to use a screening level risk assessment, which I always think is something to rule something out. Um, if you meet these very conservative benchmarks, uh, then you're done. But really at that point, you're using it as a filter for uh, uh, what, what remains that you weren't able to screen out from those very uh, 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 you know, strict uh, benchmarks so that you uh, carry them forward. And these look like you know, either sediment uh, benchmarks, uh, if you have sediment data, um, or a lot of times it'll be water quality criteria themselves in the surface water body. Uh, and if you don't meet these, then you're moving on to uh, use these as remedial action uh, goals. So, really quick. Um, 
And if you if you need to derive uh, a more specific set of ecological goals, i.e., which ecological receptor pathways are in play and which constituents, you would be going to a more site-specific baseline risk assessment, which instead of a single line, i.e., comparison to a benchmark, you're doing multiple lines of, uh, of evidence. Um, obviously, a more expensive prospect, and it's much less conservative. It's more site-specific, which is useful to you. Uh, but my punchline that I like to give for this one is uh, you really only use this if remediation is likely and you need it to guide your remedial decision process or the remedial remediation that is derived from the more uh, conservative um, uh, uh, initial uh, comparison to, to uh, benchmarks is going to be uh, cost prohibitive. So, and by that, I mean, you might not even bother doing this baseline risk assessment if um, you're already resigned because of other reasons, say uh, a, a, an upland uh, source that gets uh, down into an ecological pathway and you're gonna be remediating it anyway, you might not spend the time and effort to do a baseline risk assessment if you're doing a presumptive uh, uh, cure, i.e. I'm already resigned for remediating, I'm not going to necessarily need to go through the cost of doing uh, uh, a uh, ecological risk assessment. If I, can, if I can clean up and then maybe use those benchmarks as my goals. So that's my advertising tool. Think, of, think about the end uh, and don't necessarily uh, have tunnel vision about going through all the processes if you already have an overall remediation uh, that's going to encompass it. What I'll spend more time on is obviously uh, uh, a more robust set of uh, uh, human health risk assessment standards. Um, these are all based on exposure uh, scenarios, right? So, uh, and these are New York's up on the screen uh, or the, some of the New York's uh, uh, exposure pathways. Uh, and you're calculating an exposure for those scenarios. So in, in here in the, in the uh, uh, examples that are up on the screen, and for those of you on the webinar, you can't see the laser pointer, so I'll try to be light on the laser uh, You're either dealing with uh, incidental soil ingestion or inhalation or dermal contact. But I also want to point out, you also are dealing with things like soil standards that are protected as groundwater reaching or soil standards that are ecological resource protection. So there are multiple pathways that can be looked at for soil, and they all have their own little equation. Here's an example. And what I'd like to uh, point out in this is, if you're doing human health risk assessment exposure analysis, you come up with the, the exposure dosage, the intake rather, uh, by a full set of assumptions. And they are compounding conservative assumptions that get piled on one another. First, you're trying to figure out, okay, uh, what's going to be the exposure point concentration in the air, but more importantly, the effect is because, well, I've got to assume an inhalation rate, okay? I've got to, I have an exposure frequency. How many days per year are they going to be in, the, in that zone? Uh, how many years are they going to be there? Whether it's a commercial application or a residential application, those change. How big a person are we dealing with? What's the body weight and, uh, you know, and the average time? So you can see, uh, how uh, very easily the, the uh, calculation that you do for an exposure analysis becomes um, uh, assumption on assumption on assumption and is usually very conservative. That doesn't necessarily make it wrong. It just, you need to know that as you're making your remedial, uh, remedial goals. And then you have to say, okay, is that a problem? And the answer is different for a carcinogen and a non-carcinogen. For carcinogens, um, they're usually better studied, especially if you're up in the group A and that kind of thing where there's plenty of uh, uh, data around its toxicity. And so it's sort of, I say that's the tax cycle that block cycle that for the non carcinogens, you're dealing with a hazard index. Uh, so is it greater than or less than what would be acceptable from a hazard? Uh, so that's to me a little bit more um, uh, uh, not loosey goosey. I'm going to go with tax cycle ducks and I've got geese now and waterfowl all day. So, um, but the good news is you don't have to go through this process yourself. Uh, EPA's uh, IRIS system, the uh, Integrated Risk Ass Information S uh, System, has all this stuff already figured out for you. Um, and more, uh, uh, and, and they, they rely, you know, if you can do IRIS, that's the easy thing. Uh, if you're doing your own risk assessment, you go down a tiered system where you then have to look for uh, peer-reviewed toxicity values uh, if they're available. And if not, you might be going down to look elsewhere into other jurisdictions, say, um, you know, Cal OSHA or other uh, 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 Cal EPA, sorry, or other uh, jurisdictions. But again, my punchline that I said a little, or one slide too early is, you don't have to do this because it's been done for you, and I'll show you uh, how that works. And so again, end user. Right? Uh, so carcinogens, you're, you're generally looking at 10 to the minus 6 uh, for individual carcinogens, and depending on your jurisdiction and your risk scenario, uh, 
uh, in your future use, you may be uh, looking at individual carcinogens of 10 to the minus 6, and if you have a number of them, not exceeding 10 to the minus 5 for them all summed up together. Similarly, for non-carcinogens, you generally are looking at a hazard index uh, with a, another safety factor of 10, of 0.1 or 1. And again, if you have cumulative uh, non-carcinogens, you might be looking at uh, a bright line of not having uh, them summed up to more than 1 or 10, depending on, again, uh, the jurisdiction and the risk scenario that you're looking at. So, punchline, yes. Good news, you don't have to deal with this. Uh, EPA, uh, first in Region 3 and now uh, across the board, um, has had these regional screening tables up for a while now. They're updated quite regularly. I believe the ones we're looking at here are from last year. If I can't, I'll blow this up in a second. But the link is at the bottom of the slides as well. Um, they figured all this out for you and published it for you. So I, I, these, these are good for uh, uh, using on a site for your own risk assessment, but also a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of state uh, regulations. Um, if you don't have a published standard in their uh, mediation standards or their, uh, their soil standards or, or, or groundwater standards, um, this is a great tool to go back to and use. And many states also have the calculations that they use to derive their lookup tables uh, and if it's not on that lookup table, you can go to the calculation. And again, this is a great one-stop shop to get those toxicity and chemical uh, specific information that you may need to plug in uh, to those equations. So if you you don't uh, you don't necessarily need to be a uh, risk assessor to use those equations if you can um, get the right uh, inputs uh, for it. So that's the that's the left side uh, of the table in the blue and green. And on the right side, and this will be something I'll show you how it's dealt with on those two state examples, are what the resulting screening levels are, uh, which can be used uh, for remedial um, uh, goal setting, depending, again, uh, unless you're in a state that has their own, which we'll look at a couple of examples. So here they're dealing with uh, residential and industrial soil uh, standards, uh, but also soil standards that are protective of air in residential and industrial settings. Um, or I guess those are uh, tap water. Drinking water thing. But then again, for our theme here, they also have standards that are derived that are to protect both the um, uh, groundwater, um, or soil to groundwater pathway, so that you can also, uh, uh, you know, made up your, your remedial goals if you have an ongoing source in your data. So, okay. So let's, get, let's, talk, let's go down to talk about a couple of. Um, no, I really don't want to uh, actually install a better program. <laughs> yeah, we're so I'll use a couple of states uh, to see how those types of risk-based uh, goals and ecological goals are uh, framed in, in uh, those examples. So in New York, the DEC has the soil standards uh, all together with uh, various future use scenarios for, for uh, soil but also to protect ecological resources and protection of groundwater. So those latter purple columns on the right side of the EPA are um, uh, echoed in, in the uh, DEC soil standards, or at least the ones I'm going to show you. Uh, their water quality standards, they put both surface water and groundwater in a separate set of standards. But interestingly, the vapor intrusion pathway uh, in New York is dealt with by the OH, and they have uh, a different approach than some of the other uh, neighboring states. So I'll show you how they look at that from a receptor uh, standpoint. So part 375, uh, the downfield cell cleanup criteria, um, was put out in uh, 2006 as part of uh, the recognition by the state that they have this brownfield program and that the future use of a brownfield is not always going to be uh, unrestricted. And in fact, um, another theme that will come uh, through here, they have, uh, in a brownfield site, you have a proposed and known future use and a site configuration that you can build towards, that you can remediate towards, and that's a huge benefit. Uh, but in order to do that, um, and, and uh, to have it be a lesser uh, um, uh, use, uh, in other words, instead of unrestricted, uh, it may not even be allowed to have residential there. Uh, it might be um, industrial or commercial. Um, they wanted to put out a set of standards to facilitate this and streamline the process. In other words, not all of us are risk assessors. They put it together for us. So yes, and you're required to look at the unrestricted soil use uh, cleanup objectives in your, uh, your feasibility study uh, and your, your remedial action plan. Um, but they have this great set of 
uh, tiered standards that then go through um, and the uh, if, if you can meet residential, that's great. Uh, if you then want to go restricted residential, think uh, common uh, uh, common control over over a site, say condo complex, etc., and and restricting vegetable gardening and things like that. So there are different uh, risk scenarios that are eliminated as you go down the line, and the assumptions around the risk-based standards uh, as you go towards commercial and industrial uh, get less stringent because remember the equation: a lot of those uh, uh, more sensitive uh, uh, populations either drop out, like children, um, or there are shorter durations uh, of exposure. So again, it, they affect one or more of those input parameters to the exposure uh, calculation. Um, and the other thing I like to note is not all the constituents necessarily do that. So you can see arsenic doesn't change across the board. So not in all cases, um, uh, going from one to the next, did those input assumptions change? And even varying, you can see from restricted residential to commercial, there was no net change because they didn't change those. Uh, the uh, the equation didn't change. Uh, input parameters didn't change. And then again, um, as I said before, they have uh, protection of ecological resources. If you have ecological pathways uh, in your release area or in harm's way from your release area, and protection of groundwater. If you have uh, exceedances of these, uh, that could potentially impact your underlying groundwater. So all of these, again. For today's theme are things that you're you're picking as appropriate for your potential complete receptor pathways and your future use for your site so that you can set your remediation goals uh, which is what else we'll talk about today uh, and then as i said before the the institutional control side of things uh should not be forgotten and we'll talk about that uh in the uh, latter part of uh, my presentation um if you are going to do less than uh, unrestricted, you're going to have to have something that rides with the land going forward that documents and protects and makes sure that that continues to be so. So a deed restriction will be necessary if you're going to be doing, cleaning up one of these lesser standards. On the water quality standard side, uh, the TOGS, uh, the Technical and Operational Guidance Series 111, TOGS 111, uh, deals with both surface water and groundwater. Uh, in both freshwater and saline environments. So I'm not going to argue it too far down into this, uh, but as you see, uh, there are class A through C, uh, as in uh, pristine to uh, known to be degraded water classes uh, uh, specified for all the waterways. If you're dealing with Long Island Sound or the lower reaches of uh, the Hudson, et cetera, you're dealing with SA through SC. Um, and then GA, the entire state is presumed to be uh, GA portable of use unless um, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise negotiated. Sure. But for, um, and the basis for these are also logged into um, uh, the code. And again, for the uh, table letter. And again, I've provided the, uh, uh, the link below if you're curious as to how this all gets used. And again, I'm looking at is my uh, groundwater um, a GA? I'm looking at uh, whether uh, it discharges to a surface water body, and I'm protecting that surface water body of quality A, B, C. This helps drive my remedial goals. The vapor intrusion pathway, although my, you know, when I'm working with the DEC and the DOH on a vapor intrusion a site, they, they work in concert with one another, but the, the guidance and the prevailing um, uh, standards, therefore, uh, for dealing with the vapor intrusion pathway are through the DOH. And they do an interesting, uh, they've thought through the, the uh, pathway quite thoroughly, and they put out uh, matrices that basically require, in order for you to evaluate whether or not there's a vapor intrusion problem, uh, you need to have both the indoor air and the underlying sub-slab vapor uh, before you can answer that. So as you can see, if there's nothing in both of those, well, obviously no further action, on through if you have um, uh, sub-slab uh, concentrations that are a uh, uh, potential risk to the indoor air, um, and it's in the indoor air, obviously you're going to be mitigating, but there are middle grounds uh, where uh, you may not have, um, you may have a, a moderate amount in the sub-slab and nothing indoors yet, so you may be required to monitor that going forward, um, not necessarily mitigate. Um, or uh, if you have something confusing, like uh, the box on the far right top, uh, where you have nothing uh, measurable in your sub slab, but you have uh, an unacceptable level inside, well, uh, you may be looking at an indoor source, chemicals, dry cleaning, uh, 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 recent dry cleaning, uh, or something along those lines, depending on the chemical, um, and that, that you should figure that out and resample. So 
it's a nice sort of pragmatic approach to uh, the data that you get and looking at the pathway real time. Um, note that the matrices that you see on, on the uh, left, they've only got them for a certain number of chemicals. Um, so in practice, if you have other VOCs that are your uh, constituent of concern, uh, you need to evaluate which of these uh, matrices may be uh, a good surrogate for you, uh, or obviously work with the DOH on um, uh, what kind of uh, health uh, levels uh, that you should be looking at. Okay. Connecticut, um, as a second example, uh, slices and dices it a little differently. So again, you're trying to pick your remedial goals. You have to look towards, uh, for surface water, the water quality standards. Um, and for the bulk of everything else, including the vapor intrusion pathway, you're looking at the remediation standard regulations. Um, they deal with soil for both direct exposure and protection of groundwater. Um, they deal with the groundwater and surface water protection, which are groundwater numbers protected of discharge to surface water. So they've already calculated those for you. And then the soil vapor pathway will cover as well. Really quickly. So water quality standards have been around a long time. They're updated frequently. Um, they, uh, the, the note that I wanted to make is that the groundwater remediation standards uh, are all in the RSRs, yes, but they also point back to the surface water protect, uh, uh, the water quality standards are pointed to in the surface water protection criteria, both because they are the basis for how the state derived the lookup tables, but also there's a bunch of you uh, playing a, a, a risk assessment uh, uh, with the site-specific dilution calculations, et cetera, that again require you to uh, go back to the water quality standards. So they are linked. Uh, um, the water quality standards, similar to New York, uh, uh, because we also uh, are on the coast, um, have uh, freshwater and saltwater uh, classifications, uh, acute and chronic uh, water aquatic life criteria. Um, they also uh, publish um, consumption of fish and consumption of water in fish uh, uh, numbers as well for the direct contact of the water itself or ingestion of fish from it. But the bulk of what uh, we deal with when we're doing remedial decisions uh, is within the RSRs. Um, and those, those deal with both soil and groundwater and the vapor intrusion pathway and the deed restriction that would similarly, similar to our last example, be required to uh, uh, make sure that the remedy that you're doing that is less than uh, background, less than uh, pre-release conditions uh, is both documented and protected going forward. And in this case, uh, it's codified to be even enforceable by the state, uh, by the DEP as well. So it's not just a deed restriction you're placing on the land records. Uh, it actually uh, supersedes everything else on the land records and the state has, uh, has its um, jurisdiction over it. So real quick, the way that they, uh, they deal with the direct exposure criteria and the pollutant criteria, um, the, the DEC, the direct exposure criteria, are those that are protective of contact, ingestion, et cetera. Uh, the pollutant mobility criteria are the soil to groundwater pathway numbers. Um, and unlike New York, they, they don't have a, a stratified uh, uh, future use scenario. Um, they have uh, a binary one. Uh, it's either residential or it's industrial commercial. And the residential would be akin to the unrestricted uh, version in New York. Um, and the industrial commercial would require that environmental land use restriction, that deed restriction, uh, in order for it to be uh, um, enforceable going forward. But they also put, uh, and here's the ELUR, so out of order, sorry, but that, uh, the ELUR um, uh, can be used for that industrial commercial restriction on the site, but it can also be used um, for demonstrating when, a, when an area has been capped or uh, uh, rendered, the, the terminology in the standards is to render that soil inaccessible, which is to say that it is either underneath the building and that building uh, by the environmental land use restriction cannot be demolished um, or it's under two feet under pavement, or it's four feet underneath an open area, uh, or you can also do an engineer control and cap it under a lesser uh, a lesser thickness. Um, but all of these uh, would be subject to an environmental restriction, and in the case of an engineer control variance, ongoing inspection and maintenance requirements, et cetera, which we'll cover uh, in the back end of the talk uh, that you need to consider as you go forward. Um, the other thing uh, that is important to point out in both New York's and uh, Connecticut's example in any other jurisdiction, is a lot of times the conversation around remedial uh, goal setting and you're talking to a, a client or a property owner uh, 
uh, or other stakeholders about uh, placing this restriction forever and for always on a site, um, don't forget that these aren't a thou shalt never. They are, uh, I think without exception, a if you do, you have to go through the process of getting approval to lift that deed restriction with a soil management plan or whatever is appropriate to make sure you're doing something protective and either reapply it or if you're doing a remedy down the road that no longer needs that deed restriction uh, and it's appropriate to remove it, that's great. So the conversation um, and the thought process as you're developing your remedial goals uh, should be around this is what's going to be protective of the remedy that we have in place and this is how that remedy is going to stay here. But if the future use of the site changes, there is a process involving the state uh, agency uh, at hand um, to lift that either temporarily or permanently um, in a safe manner uh, and re-remediate the site in a different configuration or more permanently. And then the soil to groundwater pathway is, is uh, in the RSRs is uh, dealt with via GA, i.e. either an existing drinking water source or a potential drinking water source, or GB, which is a known to be degraded area. Um, there still are soil to groundwater pathway numbers for a GB area uh, because they want to uh, prevent further degradation uh, for their statutes. Uh, and similar to the uh, direct exposure criteria, this companion uh, environmental isolation, which is the um, version of either isolating it underneath the building, taking it out of the soil to groundwater pathway. This is a pathway elimination uh, uh, strategy, as we were talking about at the outset, or underneath um, a, an impervious cap and general control. Um, and again, subject to an EOUR, an environmental land use restriction, uh, and uh, if it's an engineer control, uh, ongoing inspection and maintenance. So these, just a snapshot of the tables, you know, th they're simpler. Uh, there's only residential and industrial commercial direct exposure and GA and GB uh, PMC. Um, and there was talk about uh, maybe doing more categories, say uh, recreational in between. Uh, residential and industrial commercial, but that has not come to fruition at, uh, as at this point. Uh, moving on to the groundwater and how they deal with that. Um, there's drinking water standards, groundwater protection criteria, and there's surface water protection criteria, and the volatilization criteria uh, that are protective of indoor air. Which I'll go over. Those are all groundwater numbers, not uh, surface water and not indoor air numbers. Um, so the, the whole GA versus GB thing in Connecticut is important because a vast majority, similar to New York and, and the other states, uh, with the exception of you can find the industrial uh, corridors of historic uh, manufacturing in Connecticut. And, uh, I guess you can all pick out the Housatonic and the Quinnipiac and the Connecticut River and the uh, Thames River pretty easily without any features. Oh, yeah, and, and Stanford and Bridgeport uh, and, and New London. Um, so Getting back to the risk uh, calculations, uh, they have the groundwater protection criteria are already uh, calculated out for you, and they're based on 10 to the minus 6 for uh, carcinogens and hazard index of 1. Um, they are largely based on federal MCLs when available, and otherwise uh, they derive them. Um, they also went through, if they look different than other jurisdictions, I, I always like to throw that out there. They also went through an adjustment uh, based on detection limits. Uh, so if, even if the, the cancer risk was lower than that, they adjusted it up for what is achievable at the laboratory. But they also said, yeah, you know, when we get to 50,000 PPD or something, that's, that's too much. They also adjusted some of the numbers downward to uh, have ceiling levels. Just if you're wondering why they look different. The surface water protection criteria, you know, you'd think, okay, uh, how often is it going to be discharging to a, a water body? How often do I need to deal with this in a site in Connecticut? A lot. Uh, we're a water-rich state, as most of the, the uh, member states are here, um, and uh, you can't really uh, necessarily uh, uh, look in any particular direction on any given site and not expect to have to deal with surface water protection. And then lastly, the volatilization criteria. These, uh, uh, these were actually put out in 1996, so that was well, in, uh, well back into the infancy of the vapor intrusion pathways sort of coming to light. Um, so these have been around a long time. Um, they currently apply to only 15 feet from a, the bottom of the basement or any uh, habitable structure. Um, and uh, there's, they're proposing to go to 30 feet uh, just because it's been recognized over time that that may not be uh, conservative enough. Um, and similar to the other soil standards, there's a residential uh, set of calculations and there's an industrial commercial set of calculations, again, requiring a deed restriction to memorialize that. But also, from since we're talking pathway analysis, 
these are groundwater numbers that theoretically would yield soil vapor that would theoretically intrude into an indoor airspace that would exceed a, a health-based uh, number. Those health-based numbers for the indoor air are in the uh, appendices of the RSRs. So are the soil vapor numbers, and you can actually use those in lieu of. If you don't like what you found out from the groundwater numbers, you can look at the soil vapor and see if you comply there. You can also do an indoor air uh, uh, program, but I think you're in it for the long haul if you're doing that. And then also, these are from the DEP's uh, RSR course. Um, they also look at this from a pathway analysis. So if you have a diving uh, chlorinated plume that goes, goes down and is no longer at the water table interface, um, the volatilization criteria aren't applying off to the right. So again, thinking through your remedial goal setting, uh, the volatilization criteria will only apply in certain uh, contexts. And there's the companion groundwater uh, and soil vapor uh, numbers off of the, for the RSRs. So I'm going to keep this on track. My nine minutes remaining, or actually I have a few more, but I've set myself 40 minutes remaining. Let's go back and talk about how you put this all together. So again, we're, we're, we've got all these risk-based standards. Um, we are trying to figure out which ones apply to our site based on what our, the nature of our release, where it's migrating to, that receptors are, are potentially in harm's way. And we have a couple of, uh, I would say, larger scale tools in our toolbox. We can either meet risk-based goals that are appropriate and protective of the current and future use and put administrative controls, institutional controls on top of that to make sure it is uh, appropriate going forward, or we can actually eliminate those receptor scenarios similarly uh, needing institutional controls to make sure that that it remains protected going forward. But let us not forget that, you know, that all sounds fine and dandy, and I'm like, oh, of course I want to, like, you know, cap the entire thing, or I want to uh, restrict this, I want to eliminate that. But you need to consider the long-term liability uh, and the pallet, uh, palatability of that uh, with both the uh, your the property owner and the other stakeholders of the community, um, and more importantly, or just as importantly, the operation and maintenance and monitoring uh, cost issues going forward. So I, put, I broke these into, and these are not defined terms. Uh, what, I, what I would like to talk about in the terms of passive, and then I've got the air quotes out for those of you on the webinar, uh, passive uh, uh, versus active um, tools in the toolbox. And the rest of the day, you'll, you'll learn about how those tools are picked selected and, uh, and applied. So the passive ones, the institutional controls uh, could be something as simple as zoning uh, or simple deed restrictions to limit it to industrial commercial usage or um, uh, commercial or restricted residential or, or you know, whatever the, the jurisdiction, whatever the, the lesser standard that you are picking that will be protective of that future use. Um, you could have engineering controls uh, that are, and, and I, that's where the air quotes come out, passive, i.e buildings such as the examples that I showed you, um, or liners or passive venting or reactive permeable barriers that are there for the long haul. Um, you know, they, they may still, so again, this is sort of a, a, a squishy uh, definition of passive. You may still have some ongoing monitoring inspection costs going forward, even in these instances. So do not lose sight of that when you're doing your cost benefit analysis. And the, the more active uh, things like engineer controls uh, with maintenance, i.e., uh, you know, caps that may have ongoing, uh, um, uh, you know, either leachate collection or, or groundwater collection or uh, other uh, uh, ongoing inspection maintenance uh, activities um, you could have, you know, something as uh, traditional as a pump and treat system to contain something or an air sparge soil vapor extraction system or sub slab depressurization system or any number of technologies that you'll hear about the rest of the day. Um, if those have long-term long operation and maintenance and monitoring, you want to be thinking about those as you pick your remedial uh, goals um, you know, so that you have the total cost in mind. And I put monitored natural attenuation on the active list on purpose, uh, if for another reason than to be provocative. Uh, everybody thinks, well, you know, m and is going to be my, my chief example. You know, it often screens itself out because it does have a long-term um, monitoring and reporting and uh, liability uh, that, uh, for the for the uh, uh, responsible party going forward, and you need to be able to uh, calculate that and, and go into it with your eyes open as you're trying to pick um, what is the right thing to do and what is protective. So I've got a couple of takeaways, or three takeaways, as lessons learned uh, that I think I've kind of hit on as as we've gone through here. One is 
it may look good for you to use the commercial or the uh, the capping scenario or the um, uh, you know, the remedy that is less than uh, pre-release conditions. But if that's not going to be acceptable to the future use, or uh, the site is going to be reconfigured and dis uh, disrupt that remedy, well, that's not acceptable. So you need to keep the end uh, end use of the and the future use of the property in mind as you're you're dealing with that uh, up front. Um, the, the, the sliding scale of, well, I don't know what the site's going to be versus I, I know what the site's going to be, uh, the brownfield example that we were using earlier. If I have a site development plan that I can use and integrate my remedial goals uh, and my remedial technologies to, uh, 99 times out of 100, that's going to save a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, and a known and defined future use is your best ally in setting your remedial goals and your remediation uh, techniques. So I know that's not always in our control, uh, but if you have those types of situations or you can push towards that type of situation, um, it's uh, a lot more protective, it's a lot more cost effective, um, and it certainly streamlines the process. My last takeaway, which is an advertisement for, um, I'm sure many in the room have uh, been down this path where you do all of the right things and everything looks cool and the property owner won't sign the deed restriction. Or, it's not going to be compatible with the local zoning or um, so uh, or you find out that there's an easement uh, going across the site that uh, as you're trying to uh, apply this deed restriction to the site won't uh, subordinate to your interests so that you can't do it um, i have an example where something as simple as a, a, a capped and uh, uh, access limited uh, area uh, of historic uh, uh, contamination um, crossed a drainage easement from a municipality. And the municipality just couldn't figure out a way of allowing that. They couldn't subordinate that. They, they just couldn't wrap their mind around it. So it turned out to, luckily we caught it in the, uh, the, the planning stages, it turned out to be easier to move the access limitation off of their easement, do some additional investigation to make sure that what we were leaving outside the access uh, limitation was uh, of acceptable risk. Um, to a municipal worker, so kind of a mini uh, risk assessment uh, and, and goal setting for that. Um, and lo and behold, uh, then we avoided the whole problem. I also point out that uh, doing starting the institutional control process early um, is not always is not um, uh, in addition to helping you avoid traps like that. It can actually also identify uh, things that you can integrate into your solution. So you may be able to. Um, find out that there was overland uh, easements and access, and you can build those types of corridors uh, into, your, into your remedy. So it can affect your uh, remedy in sometimes positive ways, but certainly, um, I, first and foremost, avoiding the, uh, the pitfalls of finding out late in the game after you've already set your goals, developed your remedial action plan, um, is, uh, is an important sort of lesson learned. With that, I will take questions, and I finished a minute before I said I was going to. <laughs> All right, thank you, Nick. Okay, folks have questions? Oh, help. Good question. Yeah, so the, uh, repeating the question, uh, in the case of the environmental land use restrictions uh, in Connecticut, yes, they are they're enforceable by the DEP. They do have a database. Um, they are also mapping that so you can see where they are. Uh, there's actually, and I probably should put that link in there, it's, it's great. So you can see where they are. They don't have a formal inspection program, but they have been going out and systematically inspecting to make sure that those are still there. Um, but the, the codified uh, you know, requirement is on the property owner. Uh, who placed, who has to sign um, and uh, place that on their property and it rides with the land going forward. I will also back up and answer the other part of your question, I think, uh, which is the it is on the property owner also to get those subordinations of the everything else that's on the land so that it is the prime. Um, and that can be a lengthy process and kind of a pain in the ass um, to use the technical term. Um, but there is also a process whereby the state can waive a subordination requirement if it's not materially affected by the remedy. So for instance, 
in that instance, uh, uh, that example that I used um, earlier with the drainage easement, um, even though we were restricting the whole site, that was not no longer materially affected by the restrictions, so we didn't need that subordination anymore. So we get a waiver for that. Uh, so, answer question. Other questions? They are indeed used as, okay, I'm sorry, and the, the uh, groundwater volatilization criteria, uh, are they used as remedial uh, remedial goals? And in fact, that is that is exactly what they are for. Um, they are, um, they're both residential and industrial commercial uh, standards. And then as I pointed out, they can also be superseded by the soil vapor overlying that groundwater. Uh, but those would then similarly be remedial goals if you can't meet those uh, soil vapor criteria. Any other questions? Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, we get presents. Little Namoa. Little Namoa, thank you. Good token. Sustainable. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will just put in a plug real quick for Rhode Island and their deed restrictions because I think they've got a really good system where they require the person, uh, the property owner, to certify every two years, I think, they need to send in a certification that they know about their deed restriction and that they're in compliance with it. Um, and that's, I think, a great way to make sure everybody keeps remembering as time goes on that there are these restrictions in place. So, um, that's a good system. Other states should think about it. 